So, Sir John, um, you're well known as the person who probably coined the term um, stratified medicine. We all talk about personalised medicine uh, and the opportunities it's supposed to bring. But to be honest with you, if you go to a doc today, the kind of medicine you get is pretty sort of one size fits all. So what's happening? So, so uh, Trevor, I've got what they call what I call the twenty year rule. So from the moment in time somebody stands up and waves their hands around about the next revolution in healthcare, you can turn on the stopwatch, and twenty years later it will become reality. So that was true with antibodies, um, and it's certainly becoming true with things like gene and cell therapy, and I think it's true with genomics and personalized healthcare, because remember the first breakthroughs in that domain were Gleevec and Herceptin, which took place about 16 to 18 years ago. So, so I think we're on a journey, uh, but you can already see an increasing bite of genomics in a clinical setting, and I think that's only likely to expand dramatically. I mean, you mentioned uh, Herceptin and Gleevec, and clearly they were a discontinuity in treatment, yeah. but based essentially on a very clear understanding of one of the principal genes that influence those particular oncologies. Isn't disease rather more complicated than that? Well, I'll give you some examples, because they don't all come out of the genomics domain, and I think there's a lot of confusion, that, because people have associated precision or personalized medicine with purely a genetic play. Mm -hmm. Genetics will play a role. But in many ways, some of the big advantages, uh, advances and advantages will come out of other types of markers. And let's take asthma, for example. So uh, the, the industry has been pretty dismal at creating new drugs for asthma. Since Sinclair, there hasn't really been anything of very substantial interest. And that field broke open with the definition by Ian Pavord and others that, in fact, asthma was not a single disease, it was multiple diseases. And if you take the population that have high eosinophil levels or at Genentech it was periostin or it could be exhaled nitric oxide, there are a number of markers that define that population then suddenly the world changes. And in fact, there are now seven either approved or about to be approved medicines for asthma that have all happened in the last year or two, and all based on that subdivision. So, so I think there's some really quite striking advances in that space, but not all in genetics. So why, why is that not the case for bacterial infection? I mean, everybody talks about the problem of resistance that's growing to the the older forms, probably because they're shoveling tons of stuff down cows' throats and, and so on, and all that misprescribing. But um, if, you go, if you go to the doc and get a, um, a diagnosis, either you get the wrong thing, it's an antiviral rather than a, you know, a uh, antibacterial, yeah, yeah. or you have to wait five days or seven days for a diagnosis. And yet man got to the moon and came back 40 years ago. So wh wh why is it we haven't got a simple... You know, spit on a chip and diagnose tests. So, so you're, I mean, you're bang on. There's a really good example of something which is actually now, uh, uh, now available and will be rolled out. So, you will have spotted that NHS England has decided to get Boots to do these. Yeah, I read that the weekend, and, yeah. I, and I think that it's a good test. It's a rapid test. It's based on carbohydrate analysis, but it's you know it should be accurate at least in categorizing groups of pathogens that might be relevant, separating viruses from bacteria mm -hmm. and the likes. And I think we're also not very far away from genetic diagnostics taking place in the clinic. So the new genetic tools are tiny, you know, three or four inches long. You spit into them and they'll give you a genetic sequence of that and analyze the genetic sequence in a matter of minutes. And I, I think those are going to be widely available. And I think that will change healthcare pretty fundamentally because it'll mean that not everybody troops into the GP when they get a sore throat. They can do the diagnosis yeah. at home. So I want to come on to that link, the digital revolution, patient and, mm -hmm. and NHS and so on. Before we do that, though, um, you've been involved in this uh, big project in the UK of the 100,000 genomes. Yeah. And we saw Obama last year announce the Million Genome Project in the United States. And there are others. There's Genetics England. I wish it had got Wales in it as well, but there we are. Um, uh, so this seems to me to be a very important step forward, but it's a bit blunderbuss, isn't it? You just screen everybody, look at the whole genome, and then try and find some 
some associations? So, so, there are two, so there are two big projects that the UK are doing. One is UK Biobank, which started about 12 years ago. And we really set that up a, as a blunderbuss experiment. Collect 500,000 people, analyze everything you can think of analyzing, and then start to try and parse patient populations next to their clinical data. Mm -hmm. that, that is the sort of precursor to the American precision medicine experiment, which they started this year. Uh, they've already spent more than a billion dollars on their experiment. Our experiment's been going 10 years, and it's cost us about um, 125,000 pounds. So it's, that just shows the great strength of doing stuff in the UK with the NHS available. So, so that is a blunderbuss experiment, but boy, I can tell you, it's re really yielding very interesting data because there's very extensive genetic data across that population, and we're starting to understand how you can predict people, even with chronic diseases, based on their genetic what we call their genomic load. In other words, multiple genes that all contribute to hypertension, diabetes, and like. So that's been, I think, successful and will continue to be. Genomics England is, is a whole genome experiment where we're going to sequence 100,000 people. But we're targeting people with disease. So we start with people who've got a problem, and then we work out what so the genetic So it's phenotype target. to genotype. It's driven by the phenotype. And so, presumably, if it's a rare phenotype, I mean, there's groups here today from yeah. different patient organizations where there's very clear phenotypic manifestations. Would that be a better starting point than screen everybody and hope to find in the Yeah, so, so for rare disease, it's because in the 500,000 UK biobank, many of these rare diseases will not be represented okay. at all. Uh, and, it, and of course, it's a, it's a late middle age cohort, so if it affects young people, they won't survive that long. So the, uh, the, the point of Genomics England is to go into phenotyp phenotypically defined populations get the family structure, ge sequence the genomes, and identify the genetic variants that are there. And, th and that to, and has And sometimes been, with the families involved. With so the families, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. We the need genetic. the families wherever we can get them. And that's been, uh, you know, so far it's been very successful. There's, they've sequenced 25,000 genomes already, which is amazing considering the, the first genome was only finished 15 years ago. So now we've done 25,000 very high quality genomes. The data is starting to flow back to hospitals and clinicians. The cancer program is a bit behind, but it's still now starting to take off. So we think the most important thing about Genomics England, which a lot of people get confused about, is that the intention is to do a great, a great study where we get a lot of information about disease. But it's mostly about getting the NHS toned up and tuned to the genomic revolution. So by the time we finish in 2018, all the genetic labs in the NHS will be tuned to this stuff. The pathology labs will be overhauled. The data accessibility will be completely changed. And so it's a transformation project for the NHS. And as we were saying a moment ago, whilst that's happening, there's a sort of revolution in digital health. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've got that iPhone 6 app, and there was a little thing on it with a heart on it, which I pressed. And then I suddenly find it's telling me how far I walked, how many <laughs> stairs I've climbed. And I'm thinking, who the hell else is looking at this stuff? Because I press another button, it says sexual activity. I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> so, John, there must be some real dilemmas here of linking, if you will, the patient record, which they're doing, uh, to the NHS, to Big Brother, to Pharma. How does all that... So, so and this, of course, is something that's, that's... First of all, the data revolution is real. There's nothing you can do about it. The genie's out of the bottle. There is tons of data. And as the NHS digitizes, and for those of you who've been following this plot for 20 years, you'll be rolling your eyes saying that NHS is never going to digitize. The, the, the reality is it's really now starting to bite. And I can name half a dozen regions in the country that have got really, really good electronic patient records. And on top of that, you layer digital data. And then on top of that, you layer personally entered healthcare-related data. And then you add genomics and imaging and all that stuff. And, oh. the, and the world gets very, and, very... And, and at the same time, I take my sister-in-law into A&E, and they can't find a bed. They have to walk up to the ward and see it and count the heads. Yeah. You know, we've got, we've got to get the informatics better, haven't we? Well, it, so there are two pieces. There's this, can you get electronic digital data in an organized and pooled in an organized fashion, secure and pooled in an organized mm -hmm. fashion? And then can you agree 
as to what data would be appropriate for scientists to get who are not the clinician or the patient, and that's an important one. And those scientists could be in industry or in academia. It's the same issue, and there shouldn't be any distinction. In and this could be anonymized. Because. And it will be anonymized yeah. data. And, and that, I, that is eminently doable. We're doing it at Genomics England. We're doing it in a variety of healthcare domains around the country in the NHS. But the, the, the real problem is the scale of the scale of the opportunity, but the challenge. So uh, one of the things that's emerged is if you have a big database where people are pouring lots, it's a what they call a data lake, where you're putting lots of different types of data in to be anonymized in some cases and non-anonymized in other cases, which various different people are looking at. The patient's looking at it for their data, totally appropriate. The doctors are looking at it for patient care. Scientists in the university are looking at it. Industry is looking at it. That architecture is really hard. And the truth is, no one has created such a database today. Do we have the math to cope with it? Yeah, yeah I, think you've, I think you've got the math to cope with it. And the computing, the computing has got sufficient, and I think with the onset of quantum computing, it's going to be actually relatively easy to do. But the, the, the analytical problem is huge, and the tools are not all there to really extract the okay. information you need out of multiple types of data. Right. That's a huge opportunity, though, for healthcare. So you mentioned at the beginning about your 20-year vision. I'd read this stuff in uh, the week uh, last month. It says Zuckerberg's gift, an end to all diseases, <laughs> and he's going to, all diseases will be cured by 2026. So that's 20 years away. Is that right? Yeah. Well, the great thing about being a Silicon Valley entrepreneur is you probably believe you can do anything. Which is terrific, actually. Maybe it's a good, re a good starting point. Uh, yeah. Well, so to be clear, and the point I think that Mike made, which is, I think, more important than the point that Mark Zuckerberg made, and that is that in the 30 years since I've been a doctor, we've added nine years to male life expectancy in the UK. That's almost a decade in the in the career of one doctor. Actually, a rather young doctor, I have to tell you. So. Um, uh, we've added eight years to the life expectancy of women. Mm -hmm. We have taken 75% of the mortality out of cardiovascular disease, age-specific breast cancer mortality down by 50%. We've sequenced the human genome. We've got now cures for at least one chronic viral infection and holding patterns for others. We've got drugs for macular degeneration, rheumatoid arthritis, and MS. This, when I was a medical student, no one would have dreamed that by the time I finished my career, all that stuff would be in place. So the pace of innovation in this field is second. I know that the astronauts think going to the moon is terrific, but the truth is the pace of innovation in this domain is vastly greater than in any other area of human endeavor. And I think our challenge is to say, if we want another 20 or 30 years of that, what do we need to do with our healthcare systems to allow them to really adopt that stuff? Yeah. It seems to me that's the, that, that's the big problem because we've created the problem if we hadn't done any innovation since 1975, when I started medical school, there would be no problem, and we'd still be tootling around the wards with penicillin and not much else. So, you know, that I think it's a real opportunity, but also a challenge. And those gains in life expectancy and quality of life, obviously, are the result of a combination of medicines and care in the community and All hygiene. That. It's the whole screening, thing. public health, um, the, the, yeah. lots of new medicines that have been important, but med tech. Yeah. All that stuff, but, but the but a bit uncoordinated in the NHS right now. You know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as those of you from the UK and the audience will have spotted, that you know it's quite tough in the NHS at the moment. In fairness to them, they have a pretty profound funding project problem. But I think it's also fair to say that they've got a a, a structure for the healthcare system which which was legislated in the last government, which doesn't allow them to actually adopt innovation and 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 attack the problems that we need to attack. It's very balkanized. Nobody seems to be driving the bus. Um, uh, it's very hard to do from Simon Stevens's job, but it's also very hard, hard to do locally. And so those structure, they're struggling within a structural framework which is not appropriate for a state-of-the-art healthcare system adopting innovation. Well, I think that's, uh, that's clear to me. I, I have the uh, honor of being on the Bevan Commission in Wales where we're taking a blank sheet of paper yeah. to say, how do we start again? Because you know, seven different devolved administrations all doing their own things in unconnected, uncoordinated yeah. work. Yeah. And doing things because you must, rather than because you should. You know, that's a, yeah. And there's a huge amount of savings, Trevor, in the system that we're not extracting. So people talk about, well, let's squeeze the drug budget, which is very commonly the way they go. 
But the truth is, you only have to wander around. I sit on the board of the hospital in Oxford, and I spend quite a lot of time going around and looking at the way things work. And you know, there's, if, there's inefficiency everywhere. Yeah. The thing is really difficult. And even our experience with Genomics England, there are big groups of people in the NHS which, who are totally unreformed. Pathologists still do what they did in the 19th century. Microbiologists still have plates and petri dishes and, and you know, Bunsen burners. And, you know, that's not the way this is all going. So reprofiling these workforces has to be part of the agenda. Right, let me take you to the point that Mike raised about the Brexit stuff, that, you know, if we become more isol isolated, even in a negotiated, you know, uh, living together kind of situation, um, aren't we at danger of losing or not being have access to some of the brightest talent that we need, both in our universities and our institutes, let alone the funding streams that come from Europe? Where yeah, yeah. So, so no, you're right. So, so I, I, um, I, a bit like Mike, that first week after the 23rd of June was not a good week for me, actually. Um, and I did, dusted off my Canadian passport, and I got the people <laughs> lined up, and I said to my wife, shall I book the flights who do you want to? But anyway, the, uh, some of you who are doctors will know about the five stages of grief that uh, Kubler-Ross described in areas. So the, the first one is anger. I had that. Second one is denial. Yes. I got to depression pretty quickly. And actually, now I'm sort of at acceptance, because I mean, it is what it is. So it's, it's not, a, not a bad, and I feel a lot better since last week, actually, to be honest, because I think, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing really well in the context of the world. But, but, um, uh, but, but if you do want to talk to me about a Canadian passport, I'll have a chat afterwards. <laughs> Thank but you. you. The, but but uh, you, I think you've hit on a couple of things. First of all, y disruption is not always bad. So we've got disruption. Well, it wasn't my idea, but there we are. So let's just think about how you can do a disrupted environment. And I think for those of you who are scientists out there, particularly those in the biotech sector, disruption is good. Yeah. You can do lots of really good things if the world starts to look a bit different. And my view is that the things, we've got to make sure we don't lose what we've got. We have the best science base in Europe, as Mike suggested. It's hugely powerful. We've got to sustain it and, and develop it. Government completely gets that. Mm -hmm. um, we need the flow of skilled people. It's the most important driver. So if you look at university research labs, they're about 30% European and 50% global people, yep. at least in Oxford. The biotech sector is about 40% are European um, scientists. It, I'm sure pharma's the same. We can't lose that flow of highly skilled people. Most, that's, in my view, the most important thing. Mm. The flow of money, I, I think this government acknowledges that there has been a flow of money from Europe, which has been sort of cycled. So they put money in. We take probably a bit more out than we put in. But I think that's going to get reconciled. So I think the money's going to be fine. I think the thing about European research grant funding has not been the money, because it's our money anyway. What's a big deal? It's been the collaborations in Europe, and I think we've got to work really hard to make sure we don't lose those, and I think that's crucially important. Now, you've just taken on this chairmanship of the, is it the task force, or what is, what is the Yeah, life science, the life sciences industrial strategy. So I'm right. chairing the, the industry group in that space for right. the government. So, I mean, could anybody sort of contact you on that? Yeah, so, so we're looking at what are the opportunities and what should the government do. We're thinking about a whole variety of opportunities and, and, and there will be, I think, some signaling in the autumn statement in a week's time about what the government intends to do in this space. They are, I think, determined to help us build and strengthen our life sciences sector here. So if people have ideas about where we might go in that space, and it ranges from everything, the skills things you talked about, regulation, we, we want to stay aligned with the EMA, yep. regardless whether the EMA is in London or not, and it's a great disappointment that they and probably And we're going to be talking be. to Guido. Exactly, and, and, and I think, you know, we're in that space, we're stronger together, but there are opportunities in regulation, in data, for example. Europe is very, very cautious about open data. We're much more open. Stem cells, really important, because I think we can plot a path in stem cells. Cell and gene, uh, cell and gene therapy, Nobody's worked out how to regulate it, so we can help work out how to regulate it. We can do a lot of those I things. I think you're on record recently of saying that actually Britain's got a more, sort of a lighter touch, I think yep. you said, yep. Yep. in regulation on some of these key issues. Well, I think that, that's uh, right, and, yeah. I, I, and I, my belief is we need to make that a strength because it, you know, we can do things, I think, 
differently in a whole variety of different domains that make it a good place for people to do research and develop new products for healthcare. So if partnership, collaboration, sharing talent, sharing expertise and funding is a good thing and has been very profitable, there seems, seems to me still to be pockets where we don't do very well. You mentioned the 100,000 genome. Uh, we talked about the Obama initiative. Yeah. Talking to Francis Collins recently, he's the head of the NIH in America, he told me he's, he's uncovered, you know, like many databases that actually are, have sequenced over 10,000 or 100,000 um, genomes, and yet they're not curated. They're all over the place. Yeah, and Couldn't we find some way as a group of scientists and and healthcare people to, to curate this so we all get access to this yeah. in a way. So, so you're absolutely right, and there's work on that. So first of all, to say that there are lots of databases of genomes. There are not very many databases of genomes where you have clinical Link, data. To clinic, yeah. And you know, that is our great strength, actually. Mm. And they're finding that really hard in the Precision Medicine Initiative in America because there's a 15% turnover of people in their healthcare providers every year. So. You know, if you lose 15% every year, five years later, there's nobody left standing, and you got their genomes, but no healthcare data. So, but, but the idea of bigger anonymized data lakes that people can mine, I think, is a terrific one, and one that we would hugely support, both with Biobank and with Genomics England. So, so here we've got the GPRD based in London here, and in Wales, at the Swansea University, the SAIL database, which has got every patient in Wales on their record, and with my clinical research group down there, I've got 59 beds, yep. I can identify where the patients are anonymously yep. by street code, by village, and so on. Yep. Now, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to volunteer to do a study, but that could be powerful if you lay on top of that all this stuff, all the rest of the personalized stuff. But I think you've, you've got, you hit the nail on the head, and, and this, this just comes from lots of experience in the NHS. If people believe that in headquarters in Whitehall, they're going to say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z and create a big database and it'll all be fine, you'll be waiting a very long time. Mm. I think this is regional, driven in places like Manchester, driven in yeah. Wales, driven yeah. in Scotland, driven, driven in the Thames Valley. That's where you get real traction because the, A, they can manage it, they can drive it. And these are not small places. You know, they're you know, between three and five or six or seven million people. So any one of them, you can do lots of very, very good science. And if you hook a couple up together, you That's know, what I think they're, we they're should really to. interesting. And I, it's much more likely to be done at that level, Trevor, in my, my view. Looking so. at the time, I want to move to this uh, document, which Mike mentioned, the Accelerated Access uh, Final Report, which you um, um, were very responsible for yeah. initiating and have written the, the, the forward. It says here, um, we have recommended a process for identifying and pulling transformative innovations into the NHS quickly. So we all think that's terrific news. But if I then turn the pages to John, it says um, we expect only about five or ten innovations a year would receive this uh, designation, and these will mainly not be pharmaceuticals. Well, so I, they, they, I mean, I think anybody who's honest about it will accept that there are probably no more than 10. I mean, talking about really transformative right. innovation. I mean, I think we just have to accept that. It's, yeah. You know, the industry's been great, but it's been great over 20 or 30 years. And, you know, when you just say, well, what was it last year? There's a couple. And what was the year before? There was a couple there. Um, th th that I, one of the interesting things is in recent years that number's grown, so the productivity of the industry has clearly gone up yes. since sort of 2008, 2009 when it went through a bit of a bad patch. So I think 10 is not an absolute number. The, 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 the bit about not all being pharmaceuticals is that I think the NHS is extremely worried that it'll all be pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And I think there are lots of digital tools, there are lots of med tech and diagnostic tools that need a, a bit of they need a little bit of attention because otherwise, that, I mean, they have an even harder time than pharma does in getting adopted in the system. I mean, it's really terrible. Yeah. So th th the system is really designed to suck these things into, into the healthcare system. Just looking at some of the questions that have come up, uh, yeah. National Health Services to adopt Lean Sigma Six Sigma principles uh, apart from Coast, oh God. Let's deal with that another time. Yeah. Uh, let, let, look, we've got a few minutes left. Um, so we sit in, in comfortable lives in England, most of us, um, and yet out there in the world, especially in the developing world, uh, people have very short lives. Um, 
that the, co the cause of disease and illness is largely deprivation, as we see in some of the regions of England and Europe as well. Um, what responsibility should we have as an industry, should government have in this country and in Europe and so on, to this balance about developing world and developed world? Yeah, so I, I, I think one of the terrific things that's happened in the last 20 years is that <laughs> There has been an increased focus on the diseases of the developing world, many of which don't afflict us at all, some of which are starting to encroach a bit, I have to say, but many are not really relevant to Western developed populations. And I think um, there are two organizations who've led that charge, and uh, neither one is the WHO, um, but it's the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, and they, yeah. they have been the real leaders in that domain. And I think one of the things that's happened recently is that in this country and in Canada, and a little bit in the US, is that people have said, look, if we're gonna put a lot of development aid into Africa, and given the huge burden that they carry in terms of disease, we should probably direct some of that development aid into solving the, the health-related problems of the developing world. And as you know, one, the government has put in 1.5 billion pounds of development aid into the science budget for the mm -hmm. next five years, mm -hmm. which is now being allocated to people who can help with the new vaccines for emerging infections from the developing world, dealing with some of the other chronic disease problems they have in the developing world, mental health in the developing world. So there's quite a lot of that going on. I, I mean, I, I, my view is I think the 0.7% of GDP that the government's committed to and is continuing with is a terrific message because I think we, not uniquely, but amongst very few countries that are delivering that kind of support for the developing world. You mentioned Gates. I mean, I was very fortunate to be a founder of the Medicines from Malaria Venture, and without yeah. his contributions, we wouldn't are. be there. Yeah. And the British government. I mean, yeah. they were the yeah. second largest yeah. sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Bill, Bill loves the UK because we yeah. do say what yeah. we we do what we say we're going to do. But uh, but also the point is that if we could only attack things like clean water, yep. decent yep. housing, yep. and yep. eradication of mosquitoes, that could be a different way of contributing than simply providing medicines that don't often get there. Well, I, to their credit, and, and this is a great anecdote, but the, the great thing about a, a charitable foundation that has a a single founder and no, it has only accountability to two people is they can do really bold and innovative experiments. So in 2005, I chair their scientific advisory committee for their global health program. Well, at the Gates. At the Gates, yeah. And that they popped along with this proposal to modify, genetically modify mosquitoes to actually change the yeah. transmission of diseases. And I can tell you that did not survive two minutes, the Wellcome Trust or the MRC or all the conventional funding agencies. But the Gates guy said, look, we, we should do we should try see it and see where it goes. And, and I, it, there's a plausible chance that that will be the main way to control Zika, dengue, malaria mm. in the development. Well, world. I don't want to denigrate what Mark Zuckerberg said. I mean, he is prepared to put money into this yep. area, and we should be grateful. No, for no, that. I, no. It, look, a terrific. If the great entrepreneurs become philanthropists mm. and put money into this domain, uh, more power to them. So, John, we've run out of time. Thank you for all that you're doing for this industry and for patients here and in the broader spectrum. And uh, all power to your new committee, and we can be in touch with you. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks, Trevor. <laughs>